So just out of curiosity, how many of you intended to come to the 815 service this morning and just forgot to set your class? There's no shame in that, okay? I, I expect there'll be a lot of people at the 11 o'clock service who meant to come to the 930. And then every year, right at about noon, from right up here, I can see the parking lot. And I see people showing up and walking in and thinking, oh, I forgot to change my clock. Um, this, is, this is my least favorite day of the entire year, just so you know. Not because people show up late, but because I lose an hour of sleep, and I take sleep very, very seriously. So we might just need to stop and pray for my own attitude as we get started with the day today. Um, now, actually, we, we're going to get going today. We're continuing on in a teaching series that we've been calling Four Portraits. And what we're doing in this series is we're looking at the four biographies of Jesus, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that begin our New Testament. So it's four biographies, all of the same person, but they're each told from a slightly different perspective. And they give us a different window into the person of Jesus. So especially when you read those four together, you end up, I think, with a fuller picture of this amazing life that changed human history forever. And as Steve mentioned when he was doing the communion meditation, many of us are reading through those Gospels together, just one chapter a day, with the goal of finishing those up before Easter. And to do that, we kind of put together a little reading plan. We gave you guys a bookmark back when we started this. If you're following along with the bookmark, you may have noticed something. The bookmark ended last week because we had to split it up into two bookmarks. So we finished up Matthew and Mark. As you leave today, the ushers are going to have new bookmarks with the dates for Luke and John on it for you as you leave. And actually, if, if you haven't been reading along with us and are interested in jumping in, this is a great time to do it because we're just a couple of chapters into the Gospel of Luke. So you could grab that bookmark, get caught up, and read with us through Luke and John as we approach Easter together. Um, but if you've been reading with us, this week there were some pretty kind of dramatic events that we read about. We read about the, the arrest and the trial and the execution of Jesus. And this morning, I'd like us to look at Mark chapter 16 and see how Mark ends his biography. So if you could, I would love for you to turn with me in the Bible to Mark 16. Uh, if it would help you for any reason, there are some red Bibles in those seats in front of you. You can grab one of those and turn to the page number that's there on the screen so that we can kind of read along with each other. But as you're turning there, let me just kind of remind you how chapter 15 ends. So chapter 15 ends with the, the execution of Jesus on the cross. And then right at the end, Mark includes a little bit of information that helps us figure out what time of the week it was when this happened. So here's how chapter 15 ends. Mark says, it was preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. So summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. Often it took days for people to die in an execution. So Jesus died very quickly uh, compared to others. So when he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. Okay, so Jesus was executed on a Friday. And the Jewish Sabbath begins at sundown on that Friday and goes through sundown on Saturday. Now, it was the Jewish custom at that time and still today that you don't work on the Sabbath. And work for them included all sorts of things, including the kinds of things that you would have to do to prepare a body for burial. So by the time Jesus dies, you know, sunset is coming, the Sabbath is just about to start, so there's not a lot of time. But Jesus' friends and his followers, they don't, they don't want to just leave his body hanging on the cross for days. So they, they get permission from the Roman authorities to take the, the, the body down. And Joseph basically takes it and wraps it up and places it for safekeeping in a tomb. And there are several women who are there that, that see what's going on. They see the place where it was. But then the Sabbath starts, so there's no more work. So everybody goes home. And in Luke's biography of Jesus, when he's telling this account, he adds an interesting detail about the women. He says that the women went home to prepare spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment, right? The commandment was that you rested on the Sabbath. So Friday, they start the work of burying Jesus, but they don't actually get very much of it done. So they wait during the day on Saturday, and then Sunday morning rolls around, and it's time to, to continue with that. So that's where Mark 16 picks up. So verse one, we're back on Sunday, the first day of the week, the Sabbath is over, and look what it says. It says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought, bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. So again, here we've got some of these same women. So they saw where Jesus was placed in the tomb. They know where the body is. They get these spices together, and they're bringing him to the tomb. 
And this is a detail that I never actually really thought through very much as a kid. Because, you know, just it's the story you hear over and over again. But if you stop and wonder about it, it's curious. I mean, why are they bringing all these spices to the tomb if Jesus has already been buried? Right? You know, they put him in the tomb. They put the, the rock over it. You know, what's going on? Well, the truth is that this is not the whole process. They haven't actually had a chance to finish what was known as the primary burial. So burials in the first century were actually a two-step process. So the way it worked, when a person died, oftentimes they would take the body and they would wrap it up in linen cloth and then they would put it in a tomb. So here's a sort of a picture of a first century tomb. A lot of times these tombs would have these ledges in them. So they would wrap the body up and leave it on the ledge and then just leave it there for a couple of years so that the body could decompose. Now, that was a fairly long, and to be blunt, a fairly smelly process. So one of the things that they would do is that they would bring all sorts of really strong-smelling spices and put it all around the body just as a way, sort of out of reverence, but also just out of the practicality that if you think about in a tomb like this, over the course of time that it takes for the body to decompose, a lot of other people can be coming in and out of there, bringing in other bodies, doing other things. There are people who live near this tomb. So this, this idea of the spices, that's, that's the first part, the primary burial. You do everything that you can to basically cover up the smell while the body has a chance to decompose. That's the primary burial. Then, once that's done, you go back into the tomb and you collect up the bones. And then the bones are placed in what is known as an ossuary, right, or a bone box. And it's this box, it's a lot smaller. This is the box that is then buried or then put in a tomb permanently. This is kind of the second burial, the permanent resting place for just the bones of the person who was buried. This is a very common burial practice in the ancient Near East. And you actually see this referred to at different points in the Bible. So if you remember the story of the Exodus, uh, Moses and the people of Israel are in Egypt. God shows up and saves them in a miraculous way. There's an interesting detail in there. It says that when Moses left, right, they're leaving, it says Moses took the bones of Joseph, his ancestor, with him, right? Joseph had undergone this. He'd undergone the second burial. It was just the bones that were left. But Joseph had expressly said that he did not want his permanent burial place to be in Egypt. He wanted it to be in the promised land. So when it's time to leave Egypt, you know, Moses grabs the box, packs it up, and that's part of what they take with them as they leave. So that's what's going on here. That's the process that's going on. Jesus died on a Friday. They didn't have time to finish the primary burial. So now that Sunday has rolled around, the women are going to the tomb to do that work. And look what it says next. So they're coming, and it says, Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise... They were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? Again, at that time, to keep the smell down and to keep animals out of the tomb while these bodies are decomposing, they would often have a big, heavy rock that they would roll over the face of the tomb. And the women who saw where the body was buried, they saw that the tomb had been covered up in this way. And it's only as they're walking that it occurs to them, we're, we're going to need some help with this rock. I mean, it's a pretty big rock. And first when I thought about it, I was like, well, shouldn't they have known that? I mean, shouldn't they have thought ahead of time, we're going to need to bring some people with us to help them? But, but think about where they were at that moment. They were just really in grief and in shock. And how many of us think clearly when we're in grief? I mean, this is exactly the kind of thing that we would do. They grab, they just know that this person they care about so deeply, he hasn't been buried in the way that he deserves, so they grab what they need, they go to the tomb, and it's only on the way that it dawns on them, oh my gosh, we're going to need some help with that rock. <laughs> but then, of course, they get there, and it, it turns out they don't need help. So keep reading. It says, When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Yeah, of course they were alarmed. I would be alarmed too, because this is not at all what they expected. They expected to see the stone still there. Or maybe if somebody had thought to move it, they certainly expected to find the body of Jesus there. That's why they're carrying all of these spices with them. But instead, there's just this guy, and he sees that they're alarmed, And he addresses that in what he says. So he says, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. He says, ladies, look, I know what you're doing. I know you're here looking for the body of Jesus, but he's not here because God has raised him back to life. And then do you notice a little interesting detail of what he says? He says, why don't you come on in and see for yourself the place where his body laid? Again, this is another one of those details. As a kid growing up in the church, I never thought about this. Like, do you know why the stone was taken away from the tomb? As a kid, I just assumed that the stone was taken away so that Jesus could get out, right? Like the stone has trapped him in there. 
But think about it. The other stories that we have about the post-resurrection Jesus, his body is not bound by the same physical laws that we are. He can go through closed doors and walls. Jesus could have come out of the tomb without the rock coming off of the front of it. No, the stone has been rolled away, not so Jesus could get out, but so that the women can get in. So that the other disciples, when they come, can get in. So that they can see for themselves that he is not there. They can see for themselves, yes, this is a place, this is a place where we saw them put his body. And he's not here anymore. Because God has done something miraculous. And then the, this young man is there and he gives him this mission. He says, you women, you have an incredible privilege. You have an incredible job to do. You are the very first people to witness the event that has changed human history forever. So now what you need to do is you need to go. And you need to tell. You need to find Peter and the disciples and tell them what happened. Tell them that Jesus is going to appear to them as well in Galilee. So think about it. These are the very first women who get to do what pastors have done every Sunday for 2,000 years. To tell a watching, hurting world that Jesus is not in the tomb anymore. He has come back to life. That's their charge. And do you know how they respond? It says, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So what do they do with this incredible news? Do, do they go and find the disciples and tell them what's going on? No. They don't do anything. They're terrified. So they just run away and they don't tell anything to anybody. And that, my friends, is where Mark's biography of Jesus ends. Or does it? Because it turns out that Mark has got sort of a choose-your-own-adventure thing going on at the end. There's two or three. <laughs> There's really more than one possible ending to the Gospel of Mark. So do me a favor. Pull out the Bibles that you're reading along with and look at it. How many of your Bibles stop with Mark chapter 16, verse 8? None of them, right? I mean, almost all of them include verses 9 through 20. But if they do, they maybe include it in a different way. Maybe there's like a little line there, and everything that comes after it is like, hey, man, I'm not sure about this. Or maybe verses 9 through 20 are in italics. Or maybe there's a little asterisk that says something like this, that says, uh, you know, some of the earliest manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 through 20. Do you guys have something like that in the Bible that you wrote? Yeah, most people do. Or, if you're really lucky, your Bible may also have an additional footnote in it that says something like this. Some other manuscripts don't have verses 9 through 20, but instead they have this other shorter alternate ending. So what's going on here? And I think this is worth talking about because it's really not very often that you read in the Bible and the scholars who sort of tried to assemble the, the ancient text that the Bible is translated from say, hey, here's a pretty lengthy chunk of verses and to be quite honest, we are not sure that this was in the original manuscript. So I want us to drill down on this for a minute and talk about it. But, but as we do that, this is the, the key thing that you need to keep in mind. When you hold the Bible, right, the Bible that you have in your hand is the result of a God-led, God-empowered process that took place over thousands of years and involved an awful lot of hard work and an awful lot of careful investigation. Like when the original author sat down to write the Bible, nobody sat down and started at Genesis 1 and ended at Revelation, right, the first time through. These different letters were written at different times, they were copied in different ways, and then eventually they were brought together under God's leadership into the Bible that we have today. But you gotta remember, like the printing press, what we use to make multiple copies of the Bible that are all exactly the same over and over again, that's a fairly recent invention. It's about 500 years old. But the original texts of the New Testament are about 2,000 years old. And the original texts for the Old Testament are even older than that. So until the printing press came along, the way that people made new copies of the Bible was to copy it by hand. And that is an incredibly long and sort of a challenging process. But over the years, the people who made these copies, they did just a, an incredible job of copying them accurately, of not making mistakes, of truthfully capturing the revelation and wisdom of God that was expressed in it. In fact, you read there are all sorts of amazing stories of the links that these people went to to make sure that the copies were accurate. You know, there's a story of one Jewish scholar who was copying a portion of the Old Testament, and after every single letter that he wrote, he would get up and he would wash his hands, and then he would come back and be very careful to make sure the next letter was the right letter, and he would repeat the process. There are other stories about people who would write out a manuscript of one of the Gospels, for example. And that's a process that could take months because they didn't have ballpoint pens. This is sort of quills and ink. You've got to make your own ink, all this kind of thing. And they would get to the whole, all at the end. They'd write this whole thing. Months has gone into this. And then they would look back and realize there was a tiny little mistake in there. The kind of typo that we wouldn't even bother correcting in a text message. 
and they would destroy the entire manuscript because they were just completely committed to making sure that the copies that they made were accurate and they did not include errors. And the way that we know they did that is that we can look at all the ancient manuscripts that we have and compare them, and it is remarkable how accurate and how similar they are. And just so you know the scale of what we're talking about, when you talk about the the number of ancient manuscripts that we have uh, that sort of make up the Bible that we look at, did you know that we have almost 25,000 ancient manuscripts that include at least a part of the New Testament? 25,000. I mean, that's incredible. And even if you just look at the the manuscripts that are written in the original Greek language of the New Testament, there's there's more than 5,500 of those. And some of those documents, they were written within a generation or so of when the original texts were written down, when that original manuscript was written. So this is a picture of a little fragment of papyrus. It's called the Ryland Fragment. Um, And it's actually got writing on both sides of it. And both sides of it have parts of verses from John chapter 18. So the best that scholars have figured out, they do all these scientific things to try to date it. They think that this fragment was written somewhere between 115 and 130 AD. So John, who wrote this, we believe John wrote his gospel somewhere around 90 AD. So somewhere between 20 and 40 years after John wrote the original copy of this, this copy is made. This is incredibly close in the time to when it was actually written, from when that original manuscript was produced. And just so that you see how how unusual that is compared to other ancient documents, let's do a little comparison. Uh, Other ancient documents. How many of you in school had to read the Iliad by Homer? Anybody have to read that, the Iliad and the Odyssey? Personally, I preferred the Odyssey. The Iliad, I thought, was a little drawn out, but that was just me. So the Iliad, apart from the New Testament, the Iliad is the the ancient document with the most existing manuscripts of that. Do you know how many copies of the Iliad there are? 643. Okay, that's a lot less than 25,000. And the oldest existing copy that we have of the Iliad was written in about 800 BC, which is 500 years after Homer wrote it. So for John, we've got a little fragment that was written within a generation of when he wrote it, and it's one of 25,000. For the Iliad, we got 600 and change, and the earliest one is 500 years after he wrote it. Or another famous ancient document is Caesar's Gallic Wars, where he talked about sort of the wars that he led in France. There's only 10 existing manuscripts of that, and the oldest one is a copy that was made almost 1,000 years after Caesar wrote it. So when it comes to the work that people do of trying to figure out, okay, what was in this ancient text? What was the original text what was like? The way that you do that is you compare all the ancient copies that you have and see where they are in alignment with each other. And the older a document is, the closer it was to the time that it was written the more weight you pin into that because there's less chance that errors have gotten into it and there's more trust you can put in that. And and that's what scholars have done over the years when it comes to the Bible. This this field of study is known as textual criticism. And it still goes on today. Like occasionally they'll find a new manuscript somewhere. They're doing excavations in Israel because they're building something and somebody finds an old papyrus with a scroll. So they pull it out and they look at it. And then they compare that to the existing body of knowledge. And again, when it comes to the Bible, there is just nothing that compares to this, right? There's nothing that compares to the amount of data that we have for it. 25,000 copies, some of which were written within a generation of when the original was written down. So when you look at that, you look at the text of the Bible that we have, there is nobody, secular or otherwise, there's no scholar who argues with what a scholar named A.T. Robertson said. So this is his quote. He says, the vast array of manuscripts, all these 25,000, has enabled textual scholars to accurately reconstruct the original text with more than 99.9% accuracy. Now, I don't know about you all, but that is a way better score than I got in pretty much any class I was ever in in college. And it's just amazing to me because, again, these are handwritten copies when you think about it. Now, that's not saying that there isn't that 0.1% that we have to deal with. There are occasionally little things slipped in. Maybe a scribe put the wrong word in. Or maybe he spelled something wrong. Or maybe he forgot a word. Or every once in a while you see these instances where you get the sense that the scribe thought that the original text just wasn't as clear as it wanted to be, so he might add a little bit of clarification there. But again, because we have so many of these ancient manuscripts, we can compare them and we can see when those things are happening, right? Because if you've got a whole bunch of manuscripts that are earlier that don't have this thing in it, you can assume that that difference was added later. And then very occasionally you get to things where there's some sort of equally old manuscripts that that compare and they differ in some slight ways. And if you've got a good translation of the Bible, it will point that out to you. There'll be a little footnote that says, you know, other manuscripts say this. But the amazing thing about that is when you look at those little things, they just are really very inconsequential, right? There's, without exception, the differences that you see are minor. 
and they don't impact the story or the teaching or the truth of scripture in meaningful ways. Right? It's not like there's a, a manuscript out there with a misplaced comma and all of a sudden we're like, wait a minute, I don't know if Jesus died for our sins. Right? It doesn't really broach on the things that are really true and most important. And all of that, all of that brings us back to Mark's gospel and how it ends. Because do you know why that little footnote is in there? It's because the earliest Greek documents that we have for Mark's gospel do not include either of these endings, the longer one, verses 9 through 20, or that shorter one you sometimes see. The translations that we use today, like the NIV, that's what the Pew Bible is, right? those are based on the most ancient Greek manuscripts, and all of the most ancient Greek manuscripts end with verse 8. And in addition to that, there's evidence outside of Scripture itself that supports that the, the original manuscript ended there. So you look at the writings of early church leaders, for example. There's tons and tons of writing from early church leaders that's been preserved. And one of the things that they often would do as they're writing is they would quote parts of these different letters and texts that make up the New Testament. And if you look at the whole scope of everything these early church leaders wrote, and you look at just the quotes, they quote the different parts of the New Testament in so many ways, you can almost reconstruct the entire New Testament just by looking at the quotes that they made. But do you know what verses they never quote from? The last 12 verses of the 16th chapter of Mark, verses 9 through 20. And that's because in all likelihood, the original manuscripts, the manuscripts they were looking at, they did not include that. And even when you get a couple of centuries down the line and you get to some church fathers who are farther on like Irenaeus and Jerome, they acknowledge that these other endings of Mark are floating around out there, but even they say, you know, the earliest documents don't, don't have this. Now, the one exception that you can see to this in English language Bibles today is if you're using a King James Version or the New King James Version of the Bible. If that's the Bible that you're reading from, there's a really good chance that those verses are in there without any kind of footnote. And that's because the King James Version is not based on the most ancient Greek manuscripts. It's based on sort of a, a medieval Greek manuscript called the Textus Receptus that was put together around the 1500s. So it doesn't reflect a lot of the scholarship that has been done in the last five or 600 years. But all modern translations of the Bible, things like the NIV, the NASB, the ESV, whatever you're probably using, it's going to include this information. And it includes that because the scholars who are driving at that are incredibly uh, concern that they want to be faithful to the original text as God inspired people to originally write it. Now, sometimes people are a little hesitant to talk about this passage because they think, you know, somehow this is going to undermine people's confidence in the Bible. They think, look, well, if textual criticism tells us that there's a few verses here and there that we just can't be sure of, doesn't that undermine our confidence in Scripture as a whole? How can we be sure that any of it was actually in there in the original? In fact, this is one of the reasons it's important to talk about this, like with high school students or students heading into college, because a lot of times you get in, a, in an educated setting and they want to start pointing out some of these little things, and if you're not careful, that can really undermine your faith in Scripture as a whole. But for me, looking at sort of what textual criticism does, it has actually strengthened my conviction that the Bible that we have accurately represents God's Word to us. Because again, remember, we have an overwhelming amount of evidence, 25 thousand manuscripts worth that all point to the text that we have in our hands today as being the most reliably preserved ancient document that has ever existed. And the very fact that scholars are willing to lay their cards on the table and say, hey, there's a couple of very minor things where we're not sure about this, but here's the evidence. You be a part of the process for yourself. To me, that just builds the confidence in everything else that is in there. Right? It builds the confidence that the Bible that we have is indeed God's word to us accurately preserved. So I encourage people to dig into this because when you really get into it, I think the facts are on the side of the text that we can put our trust and confidence fully into how God has led this process and how he speaks to us through it. Now, let me be clear about one thing. I don't think there's anything wrong with that longer ending of Mark. It's not like there's stuff in there that's heresy or that like clearly contradicts other teaching in the Bible. In fact, scholars have looked at those verses and realized that most of those things are just sort of verses that have been pulled from other gospels and assembled together to make this ending. So there's nothing that's contrary in these endings to the rest of the Bible. It's just not very likely that Mark wrote them. And that, of course, leads to this question. So if Mark didn't write them, why are they in there? If, if over the years somebody, some scholar, some scribe somewhere felt the need to, to add something to it, to bring the story to what they felt was a better end, why did they do that? Well, this is just an educated guess on my part, but I think it has to do with the way that Mark's gospel ends. So remember how it ends. If it ends where we think it did at verse 8, this is the last thing in Mark's gospel. It says, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone 
because they were afraid. Now, that's just not a very comfortable way for the story to end. <laughs> it, with the first witnesses to the resurrection so scared that they don't say anything to anybody, they just run home and hide. Now, and we also know that that's not where the whole story actually ends, right? You read the other Gospels, you look at how human history has played out, and you realize that they told the other disciples eventually. And you realize that the message of the resurrection has gone out and continues to spread throughout the world. But the way that Marx ends it is just, it just doesn't tell us that, it doesn't give us that information. You know, I wonder if at some point, because remember, Mark's gospel was floating around by itself before things were assembled to the New Testament. Did some scribe out there think, well, wait a minute, if Mark's gospel is all people have access to, are they going to think the story ends here? Do I need to sort of add some things and clarify some things? Yeah, I don't know what drove him to do that, but I think it has to do with the fact that the ending is not the ending that we want it to have. In fact, there are actually some scholars that I respect a lot who feel like Mark's gospel did have another ending. It wasn't supposed to end at verse 8, but in a very early copy, somehow that got lost. Um, But there are a lot of other scholars, and this is where I personally land, who look at this and think, no, this is where Mark wanted the story to end. And do you know why we think that? Because Mark ending the story here, this is absolutely consistent with his main theme all throughout the gospel. Right, all throughout Mark's biography of Jesus, we see a picture of the disciples of Jesus who fail time and time again. They fail to understand who he really is. They fail to respond to him in faith. They fail to do what he asked them to do. I mean, that's what happens with the women in the story that we just read, right? God's messenger gives them this command to, to go out and spread the message, and they don't do it. They, they fail in that. They run home. But obviously, the message of the resurrection is alive and at work in our world today. Their failure wasn't permanent. It wasn't fatal to the moment. And that's, that's the main theme that I think Mark is driving at. It's a message that you see over and over again in this gospel, which is that their failure can always be overcome by the presence and power of the risen Christ. Right? It does not matter what the failures of the disciples are. Every failure can be overcome by the power and the presence of the risen Christ And nowhere do you see that more clearly than in Mark, right? If you've been reading along in the reading plan, Mark chapter 14, right? You see the disciples completely abandon Jesus when he's arrested. When he is executed, they are literally in the upper room, just cowering together, fearing for their life. These women, they they disobey the very first post-resurrection command to go out and tell people about it. But remember what we saw in verse 7. The messenger's promise to them. He says, Jesus is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. That's the point of this story. Their failure is not permanent. Their failure is going to be overcome when they meet the risen Christ, which is going to happen shortly in Galilee. The power of the risen Christ can help us overcome their failures. That was true for them, and it is true for us as well. And it is absolutely true for Mark and his life. In fact, when you look at the details of Mark's life that you glean from the New Testament, I I think that's just further evidence that he intended his gospel to end right there with verse 8. Because Mark's story is a fascinating one. Uh, Mark was sort of part of a family that had a real leadership role in the early church. But in spite of that, in spite of that good beginning, Mark's early life was really marked by failure. At one point, Mark and and Barnabas, they, they join up with Paul, and they go on one of Paul's missionary journeys. And do you know what John Mark does? He wimps out. He says, this is really hard. I just want to go home. So he abandons Paul and Barnabas and goes back home. And then a little bit later, Barnabas is like, why don't we give John Mark a second chance? And Paul basically says, no, there's no way I'm working with this guy again. He wimped out. Right? He doesn't follow through. Forget it. I'm going off on my own. That's the kind of failure that marks Mark's life. But obviously things don't stay that way. Right? He, he is able to get back up after he falls down. And you see that when you look at the way he's mentioned in the later writings of the New Testament. So you think about Paul, right? Paul didn't even want to work with the guy anymore. And yet God's power helps Mark overcome his failures and change his life in such a way that at the very end of Paul's life, when he's in prison waiting for the Roman executioner to come and kill him, he writes a letter where he says this. He says, bring Mark with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry, right? God's power was able to help Mark overcome that failure and even restore his relationship with Paul so that he was helpful to him in his ministry, And then the the first letter that Peter wrote shows us that near the end of Peter's life, Mark is with him in Rome. And it's probably during that time that that Mark's interviewing Peter, hearing these stories, hearing the experiences that he had with Jesus and collecting them and writing them down in what we know today as the Gospel of Mark, right? The very book that we have been reading and studying 
And this is what I think is so fascinating when you think about it. Mark's greatest contribution to the Christian faith came after his greatest failure. It's not like his greatest contribution to the Christian faith came when things were going well at the beginning and then he petered off after that. No. Mark's greatest contribution to the Christian faith, the biography of Jesus that people around the world are still reading 2,000 years later, that came after his greatest failure. Right? Mark was not relegated to being a second-class citizen because he messed up, because the power of the risen Christ can help him overcome failure in his life. He is able to live the life that God created him to live and to do what it was that God is calling him to do. And he can do that in us, and he can do that through us as well. And this is, this is what I want to make sure you hear before you leave. No one can disqualify you from the life that God has for you, except for you. Do you get that? No one can keep you from the life that God has for you, except for you. And the way that you disqualify yourself is when you fall down, you decide you don't want to ask for forgiveness. You don't want to invite his power to help you get back up. You don't want to keep going as he strengthens and empowers you to do that. So when you fall down, and we will all do it, don't assume that God is is tired of dealing with a person who messes up as much as you do. Don't assume that you are down for good. Don't, Don't fall into the trap of giving into despair and thinking that you are beyond help, right? When you fall down, God does not throw you out. God does not give up on you. He does not write you off. He continues to love you and he continues to offer you his grace and his forgiveness. Your failures are not final. They can always be overcome by the power and the presence of the risen Christ in your life. The question though, I think that we all have to answer is the same question the women had to wrestle with when Mark's story ends. How are you gonna respond? When you fall, are you going to get back up? When you're afraid, are you going to go cower in that fear or are you going to go out? When you realize that the tomb is empty and the power of the risen Christ is available to you and that you have been summoned to to go and to share that news with other people, are you going to do it or are you going to go home? I mean, Mark's story ends this way on purpose because when you end it this way, you end with a challenge, a challenge to each of us to put ourselves in the shoes of these women and decide what are we going to do this week What are we going to do today? What are we going to do right now to live in the power of the risen Christ? So if you see yourself in the story because you're not sure what to do, or if you see yourself in the story because in some way you're afraid, or if you see yourself in the story because in some way you have fallen down and you've messed up again, you just need to remember that Jesus is alive, and that really can change all of that. So in just a moment, we're going to sing a final song together to end our time. But before we do that, I just want to take a moment and pray. And just lead us in a prayer that wherever we are, God will help us to know where we need to see ourselves in this story. And will help us know what we need to do to move forward with what we've heard today. So would you all pray with me? God, thank you. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity that we have to to be here today, uh, to come to your word, and just to be reminded of the simple uh, but important truth that we need to hear over and over again. Um, that our failures are not final because of your grace, because of your love, because of your power, and because of your presence. God, some of us, I know, are here today, and, and we're pretty good at listing all the failures that we have and the mistakes that we've made, and we're pretty good at beating ourselves up, and just we're at the point where we're ready to give up and assume that you're never going to be able to work with somebody like us. God, would you help us remember, just from the power of your word, the power of John Mark's own story, that that is never true, right? That our failures never have to be final because of your grace and love and power. Help us remember that that is true and put that into practice in our lives today. God, some of us who are here today, we're just afraid. Um, You know, maybe we're not afraid of sharing the gospel with others, but we're just afraid because the situation in the world around us is scary. Would you help us remember, God, that because of the power of the risen Christ, our fears are not final either. Uh, that you are with us and that you can give us the courage that we need to faithfully live for you in this world. And God, for others of us today, we, we realize that the resurrection is real. We have experienced that. Our lives are a testimony to that. And the call to those women is the same call that you give us to go and to let a, a waiting and a watching and a hurting world know that the resurrected Jesus is available, that his power and presence can change things. So God, would you give us the courage to know how to do that? Would you, just in your power, help us see the people in our lives and the relationships that we have who are hurting and need to hear about you? 
give us the wisdom to, to know what the right words are and what the right timing is to share your message of love and hope in a way that, that breaks down barriers and that gives them the very best possible chance to understand it and to respond to your love and grace. And then God, as you open those doors for us, would you just give us the courage uh, to do what you've called us to do? We ask these things in the name of your son. Amen.